Okay, well, I'm interviewing Jayanta Kumar from Melbourne, Australia. Namaskar, how are you? Uh, Namaskar, not a well, how are you? I'm good. Uh, tell us briefly what got you involved in Ananda Marga and getting initiated. Uh, well, I got initiated in uh, 1972, mid-1972. In those days, I was a student and a group of people from Melbourne. Um, most of our friends got involved and that, that group formed the initial basis of uh, Ananda Marga activity in the sector and then from there it grew and developed. Uh, but the first time I got to see Boa was in 1975, uh, a few years after I was initiated. Uh, the opportunity arose to go to India and visit Boa in jail. Um, and at that time, the first meeting with Boa was with a group of uh, five Margis. There were five of us from Australia who went to see Boa. It was a relatively short visit and very blissful, uh, but Boa inquired about um, where we were from and what work we were doing. Um, so that was the first meeting with Boa, and it was a very sweet and blissful meeting. And after that meeting, uh, in those days, you had to see the jail superintendent and book up your next meeting to come and see Boa again. And at that time, there was about a 10-day gap between the first and second meeting. It varied depending upon all sorts of circumstances. So anyway, we um, waited for the 10-day period to go by, and then we came back and saw Boa again for the second meeting. Uh, and at that second meeting, I actually had a desire to, um, if the opportunity arose, to uh, put my head on Boa's feet. Uh, so towards the end of that meeting, I noticed that Boa's feet were uh, poking out from underneath his shawl. He had a kind of a, a blanket or shawl over his body to keep him warm, and his feet were um, uh, visible. My, I was positioned at the top of Boa's cot, near, very near his head. So I was coming to the end of the meeting, so I was able to manoeuvre myself around the other few people that were there, and I was able to get hold of Boa's feet and put the crown of my head on Boa's feet. And of course, I hadn't taken permission from Boa to do that. I just seized the opportunity. And Boa said, who's there? And I got my head from around the end of the cot, and I said, oh, and Boa did a, uh, a very sweet namaskar and swile and I did namaskar back again and then as soon as that happened then the jail staff who were in the jail itself they were kind of standing around several jail officers started to push us out but the feeling of having my head on Boa's feet it was like a, a blissful shock sensation went right through my mind and body and that feeling stayed for some time after that it was a beautiful feeling so that was the um, second time we met Boa and then after that we returned the group of us returned to Australia and then in 1977 a couple of years later uh, the opportunity came to go back to India and again, I had the opportunity to see Bar a couple of times during this visit. And the third, third meeting was, again, it was a, a very sweet and blissful meeting. Uh, the meetings in those days were not especially long, but it was just a, a wonderful opportunity to see Bar And it was very near Boa's head and very close, very intimate to him. It was just like, you know, uh, a foot, uh, one foot maybe you know, 15, 20 centimetres away from Boa's head and had the opportunity to be very close with Boa at that stage, very close physically. Then after that uh, meeting, um, it was decided that a, a delegation of Margis who were in India at the time should go and see some politicians in India because, of course, the Free Boa campaign was going on and there was efforts to bring pressure to bear on the government to get Boa out of jail. So I ended up being part of that delegation. We went off to India. Um, and of course, we booked another visit to see Boa um, a week, 10 days later. Uh, 
so in the interim, we went to Delhi and we saw uh, several politicians, high-ranking politicians in the Janata government, and uh, we weren't really getting anywhere with meeting these politicians, the politicians being the way they are. So finally we decided, let's go and see the Prime Minister, Maraji Desai. And uh, we went to his residence, we were able to get in his residence, we went to the front door, we were able to get in the front door. Then we went in and there a group of people standing around and then off to the, to the left, sort of the, towards the back a little bit, there was a room and there's a whole lot of bunch of people in there. So we went into that room and he was there amongst a group of maybe 15 or so people, presumably government ministers, politicians, delegates, delegates who'd come to see him, whoever. Anyway, we started to put forward our proposal that we said, you know, are you going to do anything to get Baba out of jail? And he was non-committal. He said a, a couple of things, but it was very clear that he was not going to do anything and he was non-committal. And so after a few moments, we were ushered out of his residence and we learned later from a Margie who was well connected with um, political leaders in Delhi that our presence in Delhi, particularly at the Prime Minister's residence, had created complete and utter pandemonium in the um, government circles because of the security breach. How on earth we could just walk into all these government offices and particularly the, the residence of the Prime Minister. Anyway, we found all that a bit amusing, but um, in terms of our work, nothing, nothing really got done. So I went back to Patna, and a meeting was scheduled to Seaborough, and went into Seaborough, and um, I said, Bauer, you know, um, we had gone to uh, India to see some leaders, and Bauer said, I know everything. And I said, Ba, uh, they're not going to do anything. And then Ba's mood changed and he became a little bit serious and this expression came over his face, sort of, sort of a, a disdainful expression. And he said, uh, they're hypocrites. They're all hypocrites, referring, of course, to the politicians. So as a result of that meeting and some other things that Ba said around that time, uh, it became clear that uh, he was not going to come out of jail by political means, and that, of course, is how it transpired. So uh, that was the fourth meeting, and uh, after that meeting, um, I returned to uh, Australia, and then again at the beginning of 1978, not, not long after, the opportunity arose to go to India and uh, visit Boa again. Um, and in the fifth meeting, um, it was a very sweet meeting, very blissful meeting, and um, after that meeting, there was a six-week time frame set before I could visit Borough again for the next meeting. So to use that time, I went to Berlin Sector and attended a couple of conferences and then came back for the... Uh, sixth meeting, and again uh, met with Boa, and it was a very another another very uh, sweet and blissful meeting. And then after that meeting, um, I was sitting in the courtyard of the jail complex. There was a, uh, an inner compound and a gate, and then there was like a courtyard, an outer com compound courtyard area. There was a large tree in a, a, an area you could sit around underneath the tree to get some shade. So I just happened to be sitting there. And then after some time, Dada Ramananji came out, who was uh, Boa's personal uh, assistant, and he, he walked over. And he said that uh, Boa had just decided that uh, he won't be seeing any more visitors. Um, in other words, you know, people coming from overseas uh, wouldn't have the opportunity to visit him. Um, and that's what happened. Uh, his legal team, a, a few workers, and a, a few exceptions, a, a few people that came to visit him, saw him. But the general system of coming to visit Boa uh, had stopped. So when Dada said that, um, I said to him, well, that means that Boa will be coming out of jail soon. And he just smiled. 
So this was, as far as I know, the, the first clue. Dada Ramananda is visiting with Bara in February of 1978. This was the first clue that uh, we had that uh, Bara would be coming out of jail in the relatively near future. So I decided to stay in India um, at that time, and about six months later, uh, Bara did come out of jail. His case came up in, I think from memory, in July of 78. The High Court um, in Patna uh, quashed his original conviction uh, on appeal and he came out of jail on the 2nd of August 78. So a delegation was formed to meet Bar when he came out of jail. So this was the seventh and final time I actually met Bar in jail. And that delegation met with Boa in the courtyard area and Boa's car came out of the inner jail and Boa was spitting in his car and it drove out of the inner jail into the courtyard where the delegation were to receive him. And we gave Boa, Boa was sitting in the back of the car with the window down and we gave Boa um, garlands through the window. And Boa, of course, was very frail from his fast. Uh, but he was also, you could see his power and strength and uh, his blissful persona. And he received our um, garlands very gracefully and then the car slowly drove off out of the prison compound through the main gates into the street. And there were thousands, maybe tens of thousands of Margis in the street who formed a big procession uh, all the way down to Boa's residence in Patliputra colony. So Boa's car drove down there, that was, it was several kilometres away, and Boa went to his uh, residence there, uh, where he uh, broke his fast. His sister gave him some uh, food and he broke his fast there. So, of course, that started a completely new phase. From that phase then, um, Boa stayed in Patna till the end of uh, that year, and then by the end of 78, Boa had moved to Kolkata, where he, he lived for the, the remainder of his life till 1990. So the last part of the period in Patna, uh, Boa, after he'd been in his residence for a little while, he decided to give um, General Darshan regularly and by that stage, um, Margis and um, some workers had started to arrive. Margis had arrived from all over India and different parts, different countries around the world. Some workers had come and then Boa had sent them back to their field to, to do work. So I decided to stay as long as I could during this period. And uh, one day I was at the, a rented pres premises, the rented premises where Boa had was giving General Darshan, which was just near the office in Putra colony and um, a couple of, maybe one and a half kilometres or so from Bala's residence. Everything was relatively nearby, within walking distance. So Bala was at the rented premises in his room, and I happened to just be standing outside the door, and Dada Pranavananji, who was the office secretary at the time, came out of Bala's room and he came up to me and he said, um, would you like to have PC? And I said, yes, and naturally. So he said, okay, um, stand here. And then he started to tell a few other people who were brothers who were standing around if they'd like to have PC. Then Dada said, okay, you have to go and take a half bath. So I said, Dada, you know, please reserve my place for me. And he said, okay. So I rushed in, took a half bath, came back. And I happened to be at the front of the queue and um, I was standing there, um, you know, just ideating on Boa and thinking, okay, if the opportunity arose, you know, what would I, you know, say to Boa? So it went in, did Sastak Pranam, and had PC and everything. And at the end, Boa paused as if he was giving me the opportunity to ask the question that I'd formulated in my mind. So I asked him the question, and Boa burst out laughing. He, he found it very amusing and uh, I won't tell you what the question was but he replied he said he said to me you'll know at the proper time so I was sort of satisfied with the reply and, and I was happy that I made Boa laugh so 
did Sustang Pranam and left. So that was um, PC, and Bo had started then having giving PC again from when he came out of jail and he started giving regular darshans from that point on, and all of those uh, darshans, of course, have been collected together and published in uh, an Anavach number of time. So I stayed, at that time I stayed as long as I could to, you know, be with Bo and see him every day when he gave darshan and go to Bo's residence. And there were, was a, a brief occasion when Bo came out of jail before he started giving darshans where there was virtually no one in, in Patna. Bo had sent all the workers back to the field, all the people that had come to visit Bo as part of the procession, well, most local Magis from Bihar and Bengal, they had to go home and work and look after their families, so they all left. And there was literally hardly anyone there, so we used to go around to Boa's residence in Patliputra Colony and just sit on the veranda, and Boa's room was just right off the veranda. And, you know, if Boa was inclined, he would come out of his room and he would just sit there and we would just sit at Boa's feet and enjoy his company. It was just like a, a blissful family setting. And it was so informal that Boa would often be in, uh, like, his singlet and a lungi, and we would just sit there, and, and often nothing was said. You know, Boa would sometimes inquire how we were, but we would just sit there and enjoy the, the cool evening of breeze in um, Patna because the days were quite hot, extremely blissful time and you know could see day by day Bob was gradually regaining his health and his body was filling out, he was you know, getting his strength back again after his long fast but they were particularly uh, beautiful times. So anyway, after about um, 10 days to maybe two weeks after Boa came out of jail, um, Boa said I had to go back to Australia. Some work was there, so I had to go back. So I returned to Australia. Uh, at, uh, that was in August 78. Uh, and the next opportunity that came up to return to India was in 1981. So I went um, back to India in 1981, and by that stage I had the idea that, well, I'll try and stay and, and work in India as, as long as I could, because I felt like now I'd, I'd acclimatised and I could, could live in India without getting um, too sick. Um, so beginning of 1981, I went there and stayed at Jodhpur Park and started working in central office and um, I became a you know, global, um, local, full-time worker in the central office and worked for the um, public relations department. And I stayed there for nine months. And of course, during that period, you were seeing Boa every day. He'd either come to the office or we'd go to Lake Gardens in the evening. He'd give discourses at um, uh, Jodhpur Park office on the roof and a big sort of tent arrangement that was built on the roof. Boa would come up there and sit and uh, we'd see Boa as he'd walk up the stairs and we'd see Boa uh, in Lake Gardens um, and up during that time I had the opportunity to go on uh, many field walks with Boa. He'd just be at Boa's residence and Boa would you know, call out your name and you'd get in the car with Boa and sit in the back of the car beside Boa and Boa would uh, go in the car to um, the lakes the lakes around uh, Gurihat. There was a, a really nice lake there just behind the Ramakrishna Mission and Boa would often walk around you know, different sections of the, there was a big pathway all around the lake. You could drive around and walk around and Bo was car with security and Bo would get out and he'd walk very briskly along the sections of the lake in the evening, generally when it was cool, and then go back to his residence. So I had the opportunity to do that on uh, a number of occasions during that period. And then in uh, towards the end of 1981, uh, my health was starting to give out and uh, I went back to uh, Australia um, and then in 1984 um, I started to, decided to go to India again and went in India in May and by that time I felt like 
you know, I was, I was able to go there and live there permanently, and that was the intention I had. I'd, I'd come and I'd just work, and whatever work I could do, I would come, uh, I would do, and whatever work that came up, you know, I would just do it. And you know, Boa was gracious enough to let me stay and work in central office, and um, that's what happened. I stayed there and I worked there and seeing Boa the whole time, you know, every day doing you know, different duties and just being completely in Boa's flow. And that that was different from the previous times because once you're working there and your whole, whole existence from you know, morning till night was whatever Boa's flow was, whatever he wanted to happen, that's what you were doing. And you just had to maintain the system and speed that, that Boa wanted, and that's what you did. So that was also just absolutely um, blissful time to be doing that. And, of course, we thought that would, uh, that would go on forever. And it turned out, of course, that in 1990, um, Boa um, left his physical body. And the day before he left his physical body, he gave a darshan, a, a well-known darshan, darshan called The Dangers of Communalism. And at the end of that discourse, if you go back and read it, you'll see Boa gave a clue. He's paraphrasing Rabindranath Tagore. And he's talking about how uh, serpents and demons are everywhere and at uh, time to leave this world and I've made preparations uh, to leave this world. And he's all the time talking, paraphrasing, rendering up to Gore, but he's giving a clue about you know what would come next. And after that discourse, Bob gave it in the evening, and we sat around you know wondering what's why Bo was saying that and of course little did we know by the following day Bo had left his physical body and it turned out that that also was a, a very interesting experience because I was I was sitting in my office working at the, working at the desk and uh, one data I knew quite well came up uh, there were very few workers in, the, in Tildula there was Bo's residence at the back and then there was the main compound the office complex and i was on the top floor and he came in and he stood at the door and i knew knew him very well i could see the expression on his face i knew something was up and i got up and i left the room there were a few workers and went into the next room that was empty and we sat down on the cot and he said you know Bala has left his physical body and i knew immediately that what he said was true and we sat for a few moments talking and the significance of it. At this stage, no one else in Tildula, I don't think, in the, in the actual complex, the office complex and the office grounds actually knew because he'd just come out from being in the residence and he'd come upstairs and so we decided to go back down into Boa's residence. So we went in and everything was going on as normal. It was kind of surreal because at that stage, no one in the Tildula compound was aware that the Boa had departed. So we went in to Boa's residence and there was Boa's room and outside Boa's room there's a, a large kind of living room and uh, GS was sitting there, all the workers were sitting there and we just went in, Dada and I went in and we sat down and just listening to the arrangements that were being made and GS was making you know, very good arrangements, uh, you know, the PR, what to do and how to notify the press, notify the Margies, uh, what would happen, what would be the schedule and so on, all of these different things. So I sat there for, you know, 20 minutes, half an hour listening to all the arrangements and it was clear everything was being arranged, you know, extremely well, very systematically. So then I got up and uh, I left. Uh, I wanted to be alone. Uh, and they arranged a time uh, later on that day also for people who wanted to um, go into Bala's room and to view Bala's body. Uh, subsequently, they had to make arrangements to make sure Bala's body was preserved for a few days before it was uh, cremated. and. They got permission from the uh, local government for the cremation to occur 
in the Tildula grounds itself, in the compound rather than down at the Gats. Um, so that was done and uh, viewed Bowler's body in his room and then there was other opportunities to view Bowler's body. And then the um, cremation date was set and people came from all over the world, all over India, and a very nice uh, ceremony was conducted for uh, the cremation. And that was really the, you know, the, you could say that the close of the, you know, Boas physical advent from, you know, that time when he started the mission to uh, his Mahapriyan and final cremation. Can you tell us about uh, you got Dharma Samiksha, what that was like? Uh, Dharma Samiksha, when was that? That was in uh, 1981. Um, Boa had decided to do uh, Dharma Samiksha um, and he called together um, a group of people and I was you know, given the opportunity to go in with that group of people. This was mainly um, LFTs that had been, uh, Indian LFTs that were working. And uh, Boa was um, taking reports from uh, the, the different, uh, different Magis. He would get them to um, stand up and he would uh, discuss their uh, work and their strictness on 16 points and if necessary, he would give them some corrective um, punishment. And uh, it, uh, I was the, the last person to get the opportunity, so I, I stood up in front of Bar, and Bar um, said, "Oh, you know, this uh, this little boy has come," and uh, um, and Bar said, "Do you?" Uh, follow 16 points and I said Boa and not very strictly uh, and Boa just smiled sweetly and uh, then um, he just said you know um, come closer so I came a little bit closer and he said a few things to me um, kind of personally and then um, Keshananji was beside Baba, uh, um, and he said a few things to Keshananji, and he smiled. And then, then Baba said, um, "Okay, you can sit down." So I, I went back and I, I sat down. So that was a very, you know, very um, um, sweet experience, also. And I was kind of, I was surprised and felt kind of blessed in a way that Bala didn't give me more strict punishment, but uh, that was a very nice experience. So. Can you say something about when you got Microvita Sadhana? Uh, Microvita Sadhana, that was in, uh, let's see, that was in uh, September in 1987. Um, Bala had... Um, Started, I think it was the previous month, he'd started giving Microvita Sadhana to uh, a number of senior workers and he um, had given it out to a few, you know, a, a few workers in India and he was calling particular people and giving it to them and then there were some other people who were there he gave to and some workers came from overseas. Um, and then one day uh, I was in Tuldula, I was just working, it was uh, in the morning, and uh, Dada, um, who was in charge of the work I was doing at the time, rang up, he rang me up and he said, um, do you want to get my Kavita Sadhana? And I said, yes. He said, okay, come to, uh, come to Lake Garden. So, of course, I dropped everything, went over to, to Lake Garden. And there was one, me and one Dada I knew quite well who was scheduled to get for that day. There was a, a system where you know, I would schedule who would give that day. Um, so uh, the, 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 the rule was, there was a procedure. The, the rule was that you had to have had a half bath within half an hour of being called into Boa's room to get microvita sadhana. So in other words, 
until you were called every half an hour you had to go and have a half bath so that was you know what, what we're doing and Bo was busy doing work and then during the day in the um, afternoon uh, Bo had some free time and I was called and uh, I just had just had a half bath so I was in the half an hour limit and um, I was downstairs and uh, went upstairs and went into Boa's room, did Sostang Pranam. And I was in, in there with Boa for, or must have been 45 minutes and uh, went through everything. And then after that came out and uh, sat down just outside Boa's door. There was a, a room upstairs where you could sit and went there and just did a lot of um, uh, a lot of sadhana uh, after getting microvitis sadhana you're you know supposed to sit down and do a lot of sadhana so that's that's what I did and that that was uh, extremely extremely blissful experience with Bar. so yeah that was uh, that microvitis sadhana I think continued on till uh, into um, into August and may have gone into the end of uh, into the end of September. It uh, was September. I don't know. If, I think it was about 150, 175 people got it from around the world that Bar gave to. And then, of course, the interesting thing was that after he uh, had given microvitis sudden to different people, he also gave them specific duties to do. Um, and it was as if he had given them some blissful experience first, and then, then he'd given you know some specific duty to do, and that was the case I think with with everyone. They were given some extra duty to do, and that's how it how it turned out to be. So that was yeah, that was very very blissful as well. You were there, um, as you said, living around Baba. For some time, and what can you tell us about what you notice regarding Baba and as the organisational guru and his system, as opposed to the sweet guru? Did he place much emphasis on the organisation, or was that just a side thing for him? Uh, that was actually central to everything that Baba did. Uh, you know, people forget that Baba Sri Prabhat Ranjan Saka was the president of AMPS. He was the legal president as per the constitution. And from the beginning of 1955, when um, he was requested by the Margis in Jamalpur to be the president, um, he remained president of AMPS um, until uh, his Ma Prayan. And he ran the organization. He ran it personally. Um, and this was his role as president of the organization was also different. He had a number of roles, uh, Dharma Guru, you know, Taraka Brahma, um, uh, you know, family person, obviously, um, father, um, and so on. Um, and all these different roles he did, but as president of the organization, uh, he ran the organization uh, very strictly. And not only was he strict with it, he made the point on many occasions that he had merged himself, in other words, his spiritual, uh, you can say, identity his, with the organization and to experience him then you do some work in the organization as per the system that he had prescribed and uh, there's that quote of course if you want to uh, experience me then you know do some service do some work in the organization so that was the, really the interesting thing and bar expended so much energy in any 24-hour period, um, supervising, instructing, correcting, giving programs, and in the time I was there, it was like every month or six weeks he was coming out with a new program. And just to give you an, uh, an idea of the um, sort of level of intensity that was happening, 
um, at the very end of uh, his life in uh, 1990, he had scheduled um, RDSs that reviewed defect solution where he would you know, take reports from people personally for all sorts of different groups and they were scheduled for different days of the month. So different groups of people were coming from India and around the world and it was, was fixed. It was like clockwork. You had to be here at a certain date and the meetings would go for, you know, one, two, three days and then you could be you know, subsequently released. Another group would come, another group would come and this would this went on like clockwork. So Bo was seeing so many people and he personally taking reports. I, I attended many, many, many reporting sessions um, in the last few years of Bo's life and I had particular responsibility with respect to some of those sessions. And uh, you know, Bo was, was so strict. Uh, but sometimes it was also it was very interesting because it wasn't like all just you know um, organisation work. In, in one session, I remember uh, he told the participants to enact a drama. So he called out two people. He said, "This is what the drama will be about." And he said, "Now you act this role and you act this role," and he instructed them to start playing the drama. And of course, they were doing all sorts of foolish things and everyone was in stitches of laughter and Boa was uh, highly entertained. So that was just one very amusing uh, episode. There was another time I remember when Boa was um, talking. He was giving a discourse and um, part of my role was to you know, take the notes from the discourse and uh, the people who were taking down the notes were stationed strategically around Boa's um, you could say court or sete where he would seat. There was one on one side, one on the other side, and sometimes one in the middle. And Bala sometimes, he, of course, he knew he he had given us the duty to do this work. He knew where we were and what we were trying to do. <laughs> and sometimes Bala would just, it's like he'd put his hand over his mouth and he'd look towards the wall knowing full well that we, you know, we would be struggle to, to listening to what he said. Then he'd look over at us and smile. And it was as much to say, you know, did you get that? Did, did you hear that? Did you note it down properly? So it was very, very playful, very mischievous sometimes. And of course, in other times, he was extremely strict and very, very serious. Uh, on another time, there was another time where he would do demonstrations. I can tell you one time I witnessed where uh, Bauer was, uh, gave a, a, a microvita demonstration. He gave a demonstration of negative microvita. There was one person who was extremely strong and healthy, um, and he was called, and Bauer said, OK, you stand in front of me, and he, he stood there, and Bauer got his stick and he applied negative microvita to his legs. And after a couple of minutes, something started to happen and we could see that this particular Margie started to feel a little bit uncomfortable. And then um, after another couple of minutes, you could see he was becoming extremely uncomfortable. And then Bala said, uh, this uh, negative microvita uh, uh, is starting to move up his legs towards the upper part of his body and if it gets to his organs in the upper part of his body it's uh, very hard for him to survive. So Bar uh, withdrew the negative microvita, he said it, uh, taken it out and by this stage the person was having great difficulty standing so Bar had said, okay, you go out onto the balcony, and this was the upstairs room, <coughs> excuse me, above his residence in Lake Gardens, and, and this was the area where Boa would take reporting and give Sunday darshan, and uh, outside there was a big balcony area, so Boa instructed that he should go outside on the balcony, and he said a couple of workers should go out there and massage him. And that's what happened. And it turned out that I happened to be standing on that day just right there, and I could see him in the corner of my eye 
how he was lying out on the veranda while I was concentrating on Bob. And he was in a great deal of discomfort, a great deal of pain. But after about half an hour or so, he started slowly to recover. Anyway, I knew him quite well. So the, the following day, I asked him, I said, you know, how are you feeling? What was the experience like? And he said, you know, it was one of the worst experiences of my life. He said, I hope I never experience anything like that again. But he made a full recovery and, you know, he's quite okay. But that was a really interesting demonstration about negative microvita. Yeah, very interesting. Thanks for that. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to finish off with? Um, well, there was. Uh, there is another, uh, there's another microvita demonstration, which is also quite interesting. I didn't personally witness this, but the person who saw it explained everything to me in great detail. Um, another time when Bo was in... Uh, Tildula, it was uh, the late 1980s. It was quiet. It was in between a period where there were hardly anyone was there. Um, and Bo was walking in the garden just with a couple of people. And um, Bo was explaining about microvita to the couple of people that were there. And he picked up some uh, earth from the garden. And he, um, like he crunched it together in the palm of his hand with his fingers and sort of like he's you know, moulding it in his hand. And then he showed them the earth and it started to look like it was living, it was coming alive. And then he did this again and it started to take on the form of some cells and uh, the form of an embryo. And Bo said, this is uh, uh, a demonstration of, you know, uh, microvita applied to matter. Uh, and then he did it again in his hand and he opened it and it had gone back to um, earth and he put the earth back in the garden and uh, he was making the point of how you know, microvita uh, can generate life. Uh, so this was, this was a really interesting uh, demonstration and as I say, I didn't see that personally but the person who did witness it uh, he explained that he explained that to me personally. So it's yeah, very interesting. If I was doing so many things all the time, that you know, really beyond our comprehension. Fascinating. Thank you very much for sharing that with us today, Giantaji.